All right, praise the Lord. Good to see you again tonight. We'll go to John chapter 17 for our text tonight. The Gospel of John chapter 17 is where we will begin. And we have message number 13 set before us tonight in our Wednesday evening series of messages that we've been going through for a number of weeks now and that we've been calling Reason to Believe. And uh, we've come to the part of the study now where we're putting some of the final pieces in place uh, regarding the uh, New Testament scripture and our reason to uh, recognize and believe in the uh, 27 books that commonly falls under the title of the New Testament books of scripture. And uh, certainly we're looking at some points of consideration that inform us uh, why we should accept those um, and uh, the reasonableness behind that, even though they are written after the time of Christ and uh, after he had already uh, died on the cross and was risen again and had ascended back to uh, take a seat at the right hand of the Father. Uh, certainly uh, those books were written after that time, but nevertheless, even though that's the case, those 27 books should be regarded as Scripture on par and with the same authority as the 39 books of the Old Testament. And uh, certainly we want to uh, make sure that we have a sound reason to believe that. And uh, we've already established at this point that the Lord Jesus Christ himself certainly believed in the Old Testament. And he recognized the Old Testament as authoritative and as the divine word of God that it was. And, uh, you know, that, that Old Testament that uh, the Jews would recognize and classify into the three categories of the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And he talked about those. And uh, in addition to talking about that generally in those categories of books, he also made reference to many uh, many events that are recorded back there in the Old Testament. And we've seen that he spoke of the narratives as historical. He talked about the prophecies as having a uh, future and literal fulfillment. And he established and confirmed all those promises of the Old Testament. And it's very easy to see that uh, he recognized the Old Testament scriptures as being divinely uh, uh, from God. But the New Testament presents that little bit of challenge that we talked about last week and the fact that it was written after he had already departed. It was written in his absence after he's back at the right hand of the Father. And so we were saying, does that cause our confidence, therefore, in those books to be shaky? Because we don't really know what he thought about that. Well, as we started to establish last time, the Lord, uh, though, though those books were written after his lifetime, he nevertheless spoke some things while he was still in his earthly ministry that set the expectation of what would be taking place as far as in his disciples' mind and what would be revealed when the spirit of truth was come. And he told them before he went to the cross that I have yet many things to say unto you. All right, many things. He didn't have much time to say it to them at that point, but he still says I have many things to say unto you. And uh, they couldn't bear him right then. He didn't say it to them right then, but he promised them that when the spirit of truth was, was come, that there would be further revelation through the spirit and that the spirit would not speak of himself. But whatsoever he hears, that would he speak. And they would receive the words of the Lord Jesus Christ with the same authority and weight as when he was walking around on this earth in their midst through the Spirit. To these men, they would be given the, the words and the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said that the Spirit, when he comes, that he would uh, show you things to come. Right, he's going to show them things to come. And uh, of course, we know we have some books in our New Testament and Hebrews through Revelation that correspond to the time to come or ages to come as we were demonstrating last week. And uh, those books written by those men or through their authority do indeed speak of things to come. And the Lord also promised them that when the spirit of truth was come, that he was going to call to their remembrance. He said, whatsoever things I have spoken unto you. And that, of course, refers to the time when he was on the earth. And that's recorded in the Gospels. And so we saw last week in John, uh, especially John uh, 14, 15, and 16, where the Lord talks about the Spirit and this ministry and he sets the expectation, the promise for further revelation and really a pre-authentication of it through these men, his disciples, uh, through the Spirit of Truth, uh, hearing, hearing his words and speaking to and through them. And so uh, we see that and uh, we have a, a promise and pre-authentication of the Lord for the Hebrew epistles as well as the Gospels that uh, the Lord really uh, set the expectation for during his ministry. And so that's Jesus that's claiming that's the way it's going to be. All right, the Lord is the one that's speaking this to the disciples. That's one of his claims that would have been validated after he died on the cross. Three days later when God the Father raised his son up from the dead. 
along with all the claims that he had about himself and who he was and the fact that he was the Messiah and the Son of God, everything that he said was validated with divine approval on it when God raised him up from the dead. And these things that the Lord spoke before he went to the cross concerning the spirit of truth and the fact that he was going to show things to come and call to their remembrance whatsoever he had said unto them. That's the Lord Jesus Christ that's claiming that's the way that it's going to be. And we can therefore recognize that God has validated those claims. We have reason to believe that uh, and to have the expectation that there is going to be that revelation of, of uh, new information after he's gone back to the Father. And that is indeed what we find in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels and the Hebrew epistles as uh, he's describing them there and talking about them there. And uh, so his claims are validated. And we see that he uh, speaks of this. The same person who recognized the authority of the Old Testament scriptures speaks of the coming of the New Testament and pre-authenticates that even before the time of its writing. And so that gives us reason to uh, expect safety in pattering our view uh, after the Lord Jesus Christ and to rest in his promises and his truth knowing that uh, God the Father has stamped that with his approval by his resurrection. And so we can have a reasonable degree of confidence in that. Now, there is one section of the commonly called New Testament that we haven't really touched on at this point. Right? Last week we talked about how the Spirit would show them things to come and kind of paralleled that with Hebrews to Revelation where he talk, he's talking about things to come in the prophetic program. He gives them and the promise of the remembrance of the Spirit, supernaturally calling to their remembrance of things Christ said unto them, which speaks to the Gospels and what's recorded there concerning his ministry. But aside from that, we know that there's a pretty large section within the midst of the New Testament books known as the Pauline epistles that we've not said anything about. Right, the Pauline epistles being those that were written by the Apostle Paul. And of course, when we come to Paul... We have to ask ourselves, is it reasonable for us to recognize the written ministry of the Apostle Paul as being on par with other scriptures? Right? Should we recognize those as part of the divine revelation? And understanding as we do that to Paul was committed the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And that prior to Paul, God had been keeping a secret. Uh, that it was hid within himself. It had not been made known to men of other ages. Right? Nobody in the Old Testament uh, received a revelation from God concerning God's mystery, the mystery of Christ uh, among the Gentiles and a purpose separate from Israel. Nobody had known anything about that. God had never spoken about that before. Uh, the prophetic program always promised that God's dealings with the Gentiles was going to be through the agency of Israel and through the seed of Abraham, the ends of the earth and the, all the families and kindreds of the earth would be blessed. Right? It was through Israel. But Paul comes along and he talks about a message of salvation and mercy going to Gentiles apart from Israel. And not through their rise, but through their fall, salvation has been sent through the Gentiles through his ministry. And, and uh, the church, the body of Christ, is spoken about by the Apostle Paul. And God reveals a secret that he had hid within himself. And no one had any knowledge of until the due time when God was ready to make it, reveal, uh, make it known and to reveal it to the Apostle Paul and then through the Apostle Paul. In his preaching and his writing ministry. Okay. And so. If we understand that about Paul's ministry. That he is ministering a secret. Something that was hid in God. That had not been spoken about. And that, that God had not testified of prior to Acts chapter 9. When Saul was converted and he was commissioned. As the apostle of the Gentiles. It's pretty obvious if that was hid in God. Until Acts chapter 9. That we're not going to find anything in, the, anything in the words of Christ. According to the flesh. That is speaking of or giving the anticipation of mystery truth right if christ spoke about it then it wasn't a mystery given to paul right? paul's claim is that prior to the the dispensation of the grace of god that was given to him for us gentiles nobody knew about this secret god had not made it known and he talks about it not as being hid in the old testament and sometimes people will often try to, try to say, the Bible says that it was hid in God. Amen. God was keeping a secret. Yes, and only in the due time, when it was right in the plan of God, when everything was in place for it, did he then reveal it and make it known. And he, he lets, lets uh, the, the secret out of the bag, as it were. And the glorious mystery of Christ and all that God had purposed in his son that was not testified to in prophecy is given to Paul to be the minister of toward us Gentiles. It's a mystery. It's a secret. In the words of Christ, therefore, he's not speaking about mystery truth. 
Romans 15, 8 says that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. He came as a minister to the Jews, a minister to the nation Israel. And he was confirming the promises that had already been made. He wasn't speaking mystery truth. He wasn't talking about the mystery of Christ or God's secret purpose to turn to the Gentiles and to set Israel aside. None of that. Everything he ministered was in accordance with prophecy. And so when you come to Paul's epistles and you see that you've got 13 books running from Romans to Philemon sitting here in our Bibles... Knowing what Paul says about that and what he says about his own ministry and what he writes there, that it was a mystery that was never before revealed, there are no verses in the Gospels that we can go back to and find Jesus Christ pointing to and setting the expectation for the books that convey the mystery. Okay? So therefore, should we recognize Paul's ministry? Was he an imposter? Is it authenticated? Is, it, is this something that would bear the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ where we can reasonably rely upon the writing ministry of the Apostle Paul and, and say that those books are worthy of being designated as Scripture and recognized as Scripture as having divine authority so that when Paul speaks, are we hearing Paul's words or are we hearing God's words? All right, which is it? And, and can we reasonably recognize Paul's written ministry as Scripture? Well, in order to substantiate that, we do, I think, need to spend a little bit more time with Christ and Israel's apostles in order to learn something that I think is going to help us to see the basis of reason for why we should recognize Paul's written ministry. Now that, that seems kind of counterintuitive based on what I've just said to you, but we're going to establish some things tonight that I hope that in the next message we'll be able to point back to and see how that it forms a basis of reason for why we can trust the Pauline epistles as the word of God and thus complete each section of the New Testament as well as the Old as we've done. And so we're going to look at that tonight, and that's why I've, why I've called you back to the Gospels once again, to John chapter 17. And uh, John chapter 17 is uh, what we want to read, and I'm going to uh, break into the middle of the chapter here. But before I read this, let me just briefly remind you that this is the same section of John's Gospel in which we were in last time, right? We were in the chapters just before this, mainly 14, 15, and 16. The Lord's speaking about the ministry of the Spirit of Truth, the Comforter coming to them, showing them things to come, giving them the remembrance of what he did in the gospel period. And John 17 is, you know, right after that. It's, it's still the final hours that the Lord Jesus Christ is there with his disciples. This is right before he's going to be arrested in the garden when Judas brings the band of men and they, he betrays them with a kiss. He'll be arrested, taken before the, uh, the trial of the Jews and Pilate and ultimately delivered up to be crucified there. You're in the final hours of the time that he's going to spend with his disciples and uh, the, the final moments and hours before he has all this befall him. And so John 17 and the words of the Lord's uttering and that we find here is happening in close proximity to those passages. And John 17 contains what I think is truly the Lord's Prayer. Now, when you hear that phraseology there, the Lord's Prayer, usually by default, our mind goes back to what he taught in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Most people think of the Lord's Prayer as, you know, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and on the prayer goes there. That's contained in Matthew chapter 6, and they would say that's the Lord's Prayer. Well, truly Matthew chapter 6 is not the Lord's Prayer. That, that's really the disciples' prayer, right? It was a model of kingdom prayer that he was teaching to his disciples in order to give them a structure for the things they ought to be praying for in the kingdom program in line with the prophetic time in which they were living. It was the disciples' prayer, really, is what he was teaching in Matthew chapter 6. Here in John 17, you have the Lord praying. And you're going to find that the majority of the chapter here, outside of the opening verses of, uh, or the opening words of verse 1 there, is the Lord in communion with his Father. The Lord praying, or we would say the Lord's prayer. And so he's, he's praying this just before he's going to go to the cross to be crucified. And he's talking to his father about what he was sent into the world to do, the work that he's accomplished. And also he's praying a prayer of intercession on behalf of these disciples that he's going to be leaving behind in the world. He's going to be delivered up to be crucified and rise again and ultimately ascend back to the father. He's going to be going away as he's made known to them in the, the several uh, chapters uh, previous to this. 
And he's talking to the Father about that and interceding on the behalf of the disciples who are going to be left in the world and who now are going to be really given the, the weight and the burden of the ministry and carrying that on and, um, you know, carrying the, the little flock especially out toward the end and his return toward the kingdom. And he's got all of that in view as he's talking to the Father. And he says a number of things in the prayer, but I'm going to break in at verse 14 to start our reading tonight. John 17, verse 14, Jesus says, I have given them thy word. That is Jesus speaking of his disciples. He's given them the word of the Father. In his ministry, he's taught them. This is how he's loved them. Taught them the truth. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then verse 18, he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Now the primary thing that I'm wanting you to see from this reading tonight is really what he says there in verse 18. He said, as thou hast sent me into the world, that is, as the Father has sent the Son into the world with a mission and a mandate and a message to accomplish, as the Father has sent me, he said, so, even so have I also sent them into the world. So the Lord clearly is drawing a parallel here between himself and his ministry and these disciples, his apostles who are going to be left behind after he goes away. Right? He's not praying that they be taken out of the world. He's going out of the world. He's returning to the Father. He's going to be absent from them. And he said, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you would deliver them from the evil. You see. They're going to be left behind and tasked with carrying on a ministry now in his absence. And he's praying to the Father and he's, he's equating the ministry of his disciples that he's now giving them and commissioning them with, he's equating that with his own ministry and sending from the Father. As you have sent me, so now I am sending them. That's a parallel that I think that we would do well to take note of. Because it, it, the, the sense really is that, it, you know, in the same way and with the same authority that the Father had sent the Son into the world to communicate His words and to deliver the, the, the uh, true words of God to men, so Christ is now sending the disciples forth with the same authority of communication. They are going to be the ones that are delivering the Word of God to the people. Now that doesn't mean that the disciples are deity. They're not God in the flesh as He is. I'm not making that equation at all. But when it comes to the ministry of declaring the Father's words and His will as conveyed in those words... He's drawing a, a, an extreme parallel there to say that this really is on par. You sent me into the world, Father, with the authority to communicate your truth and to speak your word and to preach your message. And so now I have sent them with that same authority and ability to communicate your truth. Now, if you back up in the chapter and you look at what the way that the Lord had described the ministry he had been given from the Father, I think that's telling and that, that gives you something to understand about how he saw his mission and what, what he saw his mission as as he said that you sent me into the world what did that involve well, look back in uh, verse 6 here of John 17 still talking to the father but expressing his ministry and what he's done to this point he says in verse 6 I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou gavest or hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. So you see there that he's describing really what he's done in connection with these disciples. He has, 
As he says in verse 8, Therefore I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. You sent me into the world, Father, with your word, and I've taken that word and I've given it to them. I've spoken your words. I've manifested your name as it's declared in your word. That's the ministry he's conducting. If you look over in chapter 18, he says something else about, about this, this. This ministry that he has for the communication of the word of God and speaking truth. God sent his son into the world in the father's name and, and he sent him to declare his truth. John 18, 37, as the Lord standing before Pilate, Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. Now watch this. He says, to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Sounds like he's communicating the words of God, does it not? I've come, I've manifested your name, I've declared your words, and the words that you've given to me, I've given to them. Faithfully, righteously, I've delivered it to them, and they've received it, and they've known that what I have delivered has come from you. He was on the mission of uh, delivering his father's words. And he had done that. He had done it perfectly. And he completed the work. If you look back in chapter 17, verse 4, he'll, he'll talk about that as well. John 17, 4, he said, I have glorified thee on the earth. Right? That is the son. He's saying, I've glorified the father on the earth in his earthly ministry. And he says, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. The son was given a work to accomplish, wasn't he? A work to give his words to these men, to proclaim his truth, to bear witness to them. He said, this is why I came into the world, to this end, and for this cause. This is why I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. His earthly ministry was about speaking the words of the Father and declaring truth. And he says, I've done it. I've glorified thee on the earth, and I've finished that work which thou gavest me to do. He bore witness to the truth that the Father had authorized to be Made known. That's why he could say, down in verse 17 of this same chapter, sanctify them, the disciples. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's why he can say that. He's given them the word. He's been declaring the word of the Father to them. He's made them to know it. They've received it and believed it. And he says, I've finished that work. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Father sent the Son into the world with the words of eternal life. Right? Peter acknowledged that in John 6, 68. He asked them if they go away. And Peter said, Lord, where shall we go? Where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Right? He had the words of eternal life. He had the words of God to speak that would give eternal life. He was eternal life himself, proclaiming eternal life in the words of the Father. He mentions that also in John 17. John 17 too. He says, As thou, Father, hast given him, Son, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. He sent with some authority. Speaking some words, he, he's got the power to give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And he explains what that eternal life is in verse 3. He says, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. How are they going to know God? How are they going to know eternal life? It's through the one that came and delivered the words of eternal life, right? This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So you've given me power over all flesh to give eternal life to as many as you've given me. And the way that that, that eternal life is made known is by the knowledge of the, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I've declared it. I've glorified thee. I've finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Born witness to the truth. Given them the words which thou hast given me. So then, as Christ describes his own ministry here at the end of it, after it's pretty much all said and done, ahead of the cross, 
I would ask you, when he said in verse 18 there, as thou hast sent me, was Christ sent with the Father's authority to deliver the eternal words of God? No doubt about it. That's what he was sent for, and that's what he had accomplished. And when you understand that about his ministry, that's what makes verse 18 so remarkable in its latter half. It's not necessarily so shocking to think about the Lord Jesus Christ himself delivering the words of eternal life. I mean, this is God in the flesh. This is the Messiah that's claiming that in his ministry. But the one who was sent of the Father and delivered the words of eternal life comes down to verse number 18 there. And he says that as thou, Father, hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. To make that equation and that parallel there, it's not so shocking for him, but it, it starts putting a lot of weight, recognition of weight on these apostles that he's chosen and is sending forth with a commission. As far as he's concerned, he says, I'm sending them forth in the same way that the Father sent me. Again, not that their deity are on parallel with God in the flesh, but they have delivered or have received the word that he's delivered to them, and they're the ones that's tasked now being left behind to go and to proclaim the word of God that has the power to give eternal life to all that will believe it. And so in that respect, in, the, in the, the fact that the Son came into the world to do the will of the Father and to bear witness to the truth, he's told them already in previous chapters that you're going to bear witness to me. The Spirit of truth is going to come, and he's going to bear witness. And what you hear from him, you are going to bear witness. And he says that when you bear witness, that that's going to carry the same divine weight as what he himself was speaking in his earthly ministry. So that the word of God that is transmitted through these men is on par with and of the same authority as the words that came out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ as a man standing on this earth. Amen. He sees no difference there. The words in red are not going to be more authoritative than the words in black that come forth from these men. Amen. Because as the Father has sent me, I send them. Amen. The same authority to speak and to communicate God's truth. Amen. That's why if you keep reading here, after he says, even so have I also sent them into the world, verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through what? Their word. Their word. There's some that are going to believe on him through their word. Now it's going to be their word in the sense that they're speaking it, their hands are writing it down, but you understand that it's, it's not really their word as a man, just as the spirit that they're receiving is not speaking of himself, but he's bearing witness to Christ. They're going to be doing the same thing in the power of the spirit so that their word is his word, you see. And it's going to bring about eternal life to those that believe through their word. He's making a parallel. He's, he's adding some weight now to this ministry that is going to be carried on by his apostles after he goes out of the world. It's a weighty thing. And not only does that confirm what we already learned last week about the promise that he made for further revelation through the Spirit concerning things to come in their epistles and whatsoever he had said unto them in the Gospels that will either be written by them or under their authority. But it also, it gives us a level of understanding regarding the authority that Christ himself vested in his apostles prior to his return to the Father. He gave them some authority to act in his absence that I think needs to be recognized. Recognize it for what it is and the, the weight that he puts on it. The authority that he puts behind it so that when they speak on behalf of God, how that it really is God's words that are coming forth from them. And in their apostleship, he does indeed vest quite a bit of authority. Now, this instance here where we see him equating his ministry with theirs is not the only time and certainly not the first time in which Christ spoke about his authority being placed on these apostles in the fulfillment of their roles as apostles. He actually spoke about this quite a number of times. And I'm going to show you a few instances of that if you'll come back with me to Matthew chapter 10. I'll show you one instance that happened earlier on. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 10. Here you're going to see that the Lord is going to equate the reception of the apostles' preaching and ministry with his own. In other words, he's going to say that Israel's response to these men is going to be taken the same way by God as their response to Christ himself, as far as the truth of what they're proclaiming. Now, Matthew chapter 10, this is the part of the Lord's ministry where He's actually separating out 12 of his disciples and he's going to be naming them apostles, right? Taking them from the disciples. They're already believers. They're already following him. But he's now specially going to separate 12 and choose 12 and designate them and name them as apostles. And with that apostleship that's going to be given to these 12, you're going to see that he's also going to commission them to go out and to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And they're going to be empowered to perform the signs of the kingdom. Casting out devils and uh, the uh, healing of diseases. Right. Sign, the hallmark signs of the kingdom, if you will. Now, the Lord himself had been doing those things already. Right. He started his ministry here in Matthew back in uh, chapter 4, I believe it is, when he comes into the cities preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He had been preaching the kingdom is at hand. Right? Repent, for the kingdom is at hand, according to prophecy. He'd been preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The Lord himself had begun performing miracles in which he's casting out the devils and healing the diseases. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom and he's performing the signs of the kingdom. But it's really just being he himself up to that point. Well, there comes a time in the ministry of the Lord where he understands that the impact of the gospel of the kingdom, the urgency of that situation, it needs to be amplified and it needs to, to go further, faster. And so he's going to have to deputize 12 and he'll do other 70 a little later on, but 12 especially here in Matthew chapter 10, where he's going to name them as apostles, give them the commission to go preach the same gospel of the kingdom he's been preaching, give them the same power to perform the signs of the kingdom and the miracles that he's been performing, and through the agency of his apostles now, the impact of the gospel of the kingdom in Israel can reach farther than he himself in a localized geographic area. And that's why he'll talk about the fact that the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Well, the provision for the multiplication of the laborers is the choosing of the apostles and the commissioning of them with the gospel of the kingdom and their empowerment to perform the signs. Okay, and that's what's the context and what's taking place here. And you can see that happening here at the beginning of chapter 10. He says, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. All right, so he's going to give them this, this power. He goes on and he names the 12 there in verses 2 to 4. And then verse 5, he says, These 12 Jesus sent forth, and he commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. All right, so he names them as apostles, commissions them to go preach the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom's at hand, and he gives them power against the unclean spirits and the ability to heal all manner of sickness and disease. Gospel of the kingdom and the signs of the kingdom that he had been doing, now they're being commissioned with as apostles. Okay, And so then what he does from there in chapter 10 is he essentially begins to go through uh, what, what amounts to, I guess, a, a scope view of what their apostleship is going to be from this point forward in Israel. He talks about some of the immediate things that they're going to be doing in regard to going to these cities that he's sending them out to to preach, and really talks even beyond that out to the end that's going to involve their uh, apostolic ministry to Israel in connection with the kingdom and the signs and all that. And he describes that here in chapter 10. And we're not necessarily concerned with seeing all those details tonight, but I've just set the context for you to bring you down to verse 40, where in connection with naming them as apostles and giving them this authority and apostleship, he says something that I think factors into what we were just seeing in uh, John 17. Uh, look at Matthew 10 verse 40 there. He says, he that receiveth you, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. Now that pretty much parallels what we read in John 17, 18, isn't it? He's talking about sending them. As you sent me, I send them. 
Well, in that sending, he's equating the response to that ministry as being on par with himself, right? He that receiveth you receiveth me. When you receive the testimony of God's word that's proclaimed by these apostles, the Lord sees that as the same as if you received that message from Christ himself. You believed on Christ himself, and yet it's not Christ himself, it's his apostles. But he's designating authority. Authority for them to speak and to communicate God's word. And the reception of their ministry by Israel is looked upon the same as uh, Israel's reception of Messiah himself as far as the gospel of the kingdom is concerned. Now, that's an interesting thing. Now, look over in Matthew 16. As the ministry goes along, we know that Israel, for the most part, did not receive the ministry of Christ or the apostles, especially the leadership. They rejected it, and they were obstinate toward it. And they're uh, really, the, the, the rejection of the opposition to the kingdom ministry of the Lord is taking a, a dark turn by the time you get over here to chapter 16, and he's going to begin speaking to them about he's, how he's going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men and go to the cross and all that type of thing. But here in Matthew 16, he's actually going to deal with the, the question of what the, the believers in Israel are going to be founded upon. Right? The, the little flock, as they're called, or that kingdom church, if you will, the outcalled seed of Jacob from the apostate nation. They're going to be separating wheat from chaff as things go along. And he wants to ask his disciples, those that have believed upon him, who do they say that I am? Because right? there's a whole bunch of... Uh, theories and uh, ideas and doctrines that are floating around in Israel as to who Jesus of Nazareth is. And so he presents the question to his disciples here in Matthew 16, 13. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist and some Elias and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right, so this is taking place as you're getting further into the ministry of Christ. Again, the glad tidings of the kingdom have gone out to the cities of Israel and been rejected for the most part. And we have a passage here in these verses that is setting forth the foundation rock upon which the remnant of Israel is going to be built. Right, the, the true Israel of God. Right, that wheat taken out from among the chaff. The little flock from the big flock. Some of the imagery that's used for Israel there. He's, he's called out these that have believed upon him. And he's establishing the foundation rock. The confession upon which the true believers, the remnant of Israel that will inherit the kingdom. What are they going to be founded and built upon? Well, it's upon this confession that Peter is making concerning who Jesus of Nazareth is. Peter declares that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. While others are saying that he's John the Baptist or Elias or one of the prophets, the believers upon the Lord Jesus Christ know who he is. And they say, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the issue of his identity as the Messiah. He's Israel's Messiah. And as the gates of hell are seeking to prevail against the believers in Israel and to overrun them through their antichrist, one who comes in his own name to say, I'm the Messiah. The apostate nation is going to go after him, but where's the true going to be? What are they going to continue to hold to and confess? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus of Nazareth. It's not this other guy over here. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. That is the foundation rock, the confession upon which the true Israel of God will be built. Amen. And the gates of hell are going to rage. The gates of hell are going to come against the Lord himself and it's going to take him to the cross there and they're going to take him by wicked hands and crucify him and slay him and it's going to look like all their kingdom hopes are dashed because the one that they believe the Messiah has been crucified by Israel. And he knows that's coming and he's speaking these words here to, to reassure his disciples that though that's what's coming, 
Understand that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against that testimony. God is going to raise him up from the dead. He's going to be seated at the Father's right hand for a period of time. Then the day of the Lord will begin and he will ultimately come again. It's not going to prevail. His kingdom, the gates of heaven, are going to be established on this earth. Amen. Even though it won't look like it. It looks like the gates of hell are going to prevail. But he gives his disciples a promise it's not. And the true Israel are going to hold to and be founded upon the reality of the identity of who their true Messiah is. Amen. Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. They don't go after Antichrist, you see. That's the context of what he's talking about there. Now, in connection with that, Peter has said this. He's making a pronouncement to Peter, but he doesn't stop after verse 18. He goes on and he says to Peter, in connection with all that, he says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, that sounds like just a little bit of authority, doesn't it? I mean, in connection with this kingdom church that he's going to be building, the remnant of Israel, over which the apostles have oversight and leadership they're overseers of the little flock they're going to be charged with carrying on the ministry and loving his sheep as he had loved them when he goes away and he's designating authority especially here to peter talking about giving them the keys of the kingdom of heaven that's their hope isn't it the kingdom of heaven that's that's the gospel they've been preaching that's what they believed and hoped in that's who they believe jesus is he's the messiah the davidic king who's going to sit on the throne in the kingdom and he says to Peter, as the leader of the apostles, and the one who's charged as an overseer of the little flock, that I'm going to give unto thee, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's authority. And he says, it's authority such that whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. He's talking about authority that has, you know, the, the ability to, to bind and loose things that carries the, the weight and the stamp of approval and the, thor the authority of heaven behind that thing. It sounds almost like the position of a judge, doesn't it? That's what a judge does. You know, he's sitting in a seat of judgment, so to speak, and there's situations that are brought before him, and he's got to make a judgment and a discernment about that thing, and the judge is sitting there with the authority to either bind or to loose. And if he binds it, it's bound. And if he looses it, it's loose. And the Lord Jesus Christ is saying in connection with this kingdom authority that's given to Peter especially, whatsoever you bind on earth, that's bound in heaven. It comes with the authority of heaven behind it. If you loose it, it's loosed in heaven. It's the authority. That, that's being vested in Peter as an apostle and an overseer of the little flock. And they're going to have the ministry of the Spirit to be able to minister that. But it's, it's the position of a judge is what he's talking about, the binding and loosing. And that's actually what the apostles are called to be in connection with the kingdom of heaven. If you look at Matthew 19, you can see that's part of the ministry of really all the apostles. Peter has a special place as the leader of all of them, but really it's, it's true of all the apostles that they were designated to be judges in the kingdom program. Matthew 19, verse 28 Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, right, there's kingdom, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, doing what? Judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Right, part of their apostolic ministry in connection with Messiah's kingdom is to be a judge. What's the judge do? Makes decisions about binding and loosing. And it has the, the authority of heaven behind it. And look at uh, chapter 18. I'll show you another passage where he brings up this binding and loosing terminology again. And you can see that it, it's in the context of overseeing the, the members of that remnant church. And having to make judgments in connection with that. Matthew 18 verse 18. Or, uh, yeah verse 18. Uh, well back up to verse uh, 15 actually. Matthew 18, 15. He says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, 
Then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now you see the situation the Lord's talking about and describing here, right? There, there's a brother that has a trespass. Right? There, there's an issue that's arrived that has arisen within the, the, the brethren of Israel, as it were. They've got a dispute against one another. They've got something that between themselves they can't settle. That This is going to take somebody with some authority, being able to make an authoritative judgment about the situation that has risen. And they can't sort it out themselves. And so they bring it before the church and the authority that's in the church. Right? The church of Matthew 16. Built upon the confession that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the son of the living God. Right, The, the remnant church, the little flock. They're bringing it before that church and the authority of it. And they're presenting the situation. And he said there in verse number 18, in that context, when it comes before the judges, whatsoever they bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and what they loose will be loosed in heaven. It's an issue of judgment, you see. And he says, if two of them agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done for them with my Father which is in heaven. Right? Two of these men with the authority coming together, coming to an agreeing judgment, is binding. What they say goes with the stamp of heaven behind it. With the stamp of Christ behind it. Right? He said in verse 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, I know that that verse <laughs> over the years has been taken wildly out of context. And I, the only way I ever heard verse 20 there was talking about church services where there was low attendance. Right? Something would happen on a Wednesday night. You'd have only a couple of people that had come out to the assembly. You know, we can rejoice in the Lord because where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. The Lord's with us, they'd say. Verse 20 is not talking about low attendance in church, in a Gentile church, folks. That's in the context of judgment. He's talking about a quorum, really. You got two or three of them together. They're in agreement in their judgment, and that thing's binding. And it's got the seal of heaven on it when they make a judgment. That's why they can do what they do in Acts chapter 1 in connection with the replacement of Judas. And Matthias, Peter, stands up in the midst, and he's going to use that authority to, to bind and lose and to make judgments and selections. And it's binding, and it's got the stamp and the authority of Christ on it. It's been given to these apostles to do that. But judgment's what he's talking about there, binding and loosing in that context. I'll hop back over to John and I'll show you just a couple other verses here and we'll be done. Now we'll go to John 13 here first. Another parallel that you can put in the notes of the cross reference. Just some things we've already seen. Parallels what we saw in Matthew 10 40. John 13, verse 20. Again, speaking of them, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. Again, the Lord is putting their ministry and their testimony and the communication of the word of God by them on the same level as the word of God that they've heard from him. To receive them is to receive him. The parallels with uh, Matthew 10 verse 40. And then John 20 you see all these issues kind of come together here. This is after the resurrection when he's appearing to the disciples. He's going to talk about this again. And these same concepts coming up. Uh, John 20, verse 21. The disciples are glad when they saw the Lord there at the end of verse 20. And verse 21 says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. He said, As my Father hath sent me, even so, send I you. And that parallels 
the John 17, 8 passage we started with, doesn't it? As my father sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Right? The same comforter, the spirit of truth, and that whole ministry that we were just talking about last week in chapters 14 and 15 and 16. He's talking about them receiving the Holy Ghost to carry out this ministry and to have this witness and to have this authority to communicate God's words and to render these judgments. In verse 23, here it is again, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Binding and loosing. The authority of a judge. So when you talk about Christ's apostles, you're talking about a pretty weighty ministry that they're given, wouldn't you say? And the terminology and the way that the Lord talks about it, the authority that he's designating with them, putting the seal of approval of heaven upon the judgments that they render on earth as they, as they act in his absence and in his stead, it comes with the same weight as though Christ himself were there physically in the midst rendering the judgment. Now, you say, Brother Josh, you know, we started off talking about needing reason to believe in the Pauline epistles. So, you know, what we've talked about tonight really has nothing at all to do with reason to believe the Pauline epistles. And, you know, strictly speaking, I guess that's true. We haven't talked about Romans to Philemon. We haven't talked about Paul or his ministry yet. However, I think if you come back next week, you're going to see that this material actually is relevant. Performing a basis of reason for why Paul's ministry and his written ministry especially should be recognized as scripture. This actually is very significant to that point. Not that Paul's authority comes from the twelve, and he'll make that plain and clear, but it is relevant when you consider it from the standpoint of reason to believe and to recognize his ministry as scripture. We're going to see some passages that I think it'll make perfect sense how it relates back in here. But if you don't recognize the authority that's vested by Christ in the 12 apostles of Israel, you won't necessarily see that connection. And so this is foundation for stuff we want to build on next week. We need to recognize Christ's authority given to these apostles to act in his absence and to speak in his absence, to bind and loose, and to realize that it's as though Christ himself is doing that, because that really is the case. All right? We'll stop there. We'll pick it up there next week and carry this on. Let's see if we can't find reason to believe the Pauline epistles next time. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for the time once again. We thank you for the scripture. We thank you for these truths that we've been able to uh, work through tonight with the saints. We pray that what's been shared has been uh, a help to them and their understanding. And pray that it would serve us well next week as we uh, build upon this foundation that we tried to lay this week. And uh, hopefully it will just uh, contribute all the more to our understanding and our confidence in all of your word. And that we can come away from uh, the, the message and from the study with uh, just all the more confidence and all the more faith in your book as uh, your authoritative word to us. Thank you for each one again. Pray that uh, our, um, our the rest of our week would be um, edifying and that it would be exactly what you'd have it to be as we try to walk in your will. And that uh, we would all come back together on uh, coming Sunday for another good time in your word. We give you the thanks and praise in Christ's name.